and uh, what I would like to share with you some information and experience on poor prognosis patients, uh, the new subgroup definition of the Poseidon group and the management of these groups. So, as you know, uh, there are many factors uh, that uh, can predict outcome of uh, ART treatments. And the most important positive ones are the number of oocytes retrieved, the number of embryo transferred, and the embryo quality, of course. And we all know that uh, the number does matter, as you can see. Uh, the low numbers uh, concerning uh, uh, fresh or cumulative live birth rates uh, do matter. Uh, we know that up to 15% of fresh live birth rate uh, in the first cycle uh, will be increasing, but uh, even beyond uh, 15 oocytes, the cumulative live birth will increase. But uh, what we want to draw our attention are the groups with a low or suboptimal number of uh, oocytes. Now, the incidence of uh, poor response uh, is, um, according to different definitions, between 6 and 20% of the IVS cycles that they, we are treating. Uh, this might, of course, increase now because if you look at the incidence of uh, diminished ovarian reserve, uh, it is um, growing over the years of the last uh, decade here, and this is due to the delay of uh, childbearing uh, by the women. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of inconsistent and inconclusive evidence on uh, poor ovarian response management, and uh, there are very st different strategies and very um, different uh, studies uh, that have been presented. So it became really, uh, as it was said before, a therapeutic challenge. Uh, so even the Cochrane database, uh, this is in the 2010 uh, conclusion, say that there is insufficient evidence to support the routine use of any particular intervention, either for pituitary downregulation, ovarian stimulation, or adjuvant therapy in poor ovarian response. Now, one of the reasons why we have this problem is the definition. And uh, here you can see in uh, 2000, <coughs> Uh, and uh, 11, uh, there, there have been, uh, 2001, uh, there have been about 28 different definition criteria in this meta-analysis for poor ovarian response. Ten years later, we have 47 RTC, RCTs with 41 different criteria, and no more than three trials use the same definition. And uh, same research groups use sometimes different definitions uh, for the studies. So as you can see, there is a big mixture here of a lot of things. Uh, so it was impossible to compare studies and compare results and draw any uh, management. Now, fortunately enough, the ASHRAE uh, study group uh, came out in 2011 with uh, this criteria for all of us known as the Bologna criteria. And uh, two out of three uh, uh, of this criteria will uh, define a person as a poor ovarian response, but also two episodes of poor ovarian response after maximal stimulation are sufficient to define a patient as a poor responder. Now, the Bologna criteria was designed to select a homogeneous group of patients based on oocyte quantity for testing in prospective randomized trial for different strategies. So now we have a, one criteria for, for all the studies. But unfortunately, when we look at the subgroups of the Bologna criteria, we see that we can figure out about eight subgroups if you want even 13 different subgroups. So it's really not as homogeneous as uh, we thought uh, it uh, should uh, be. Now, in uh, poor ovarian response, uh, we would like to know at, ahead of time that we have a patient that might react like that. And for ovarian response, uh, we need some markers. So a good marker should tell us something about the ovarian response, the quantity of the oocytes. But we also want to have from the marker some information about 
uh, the quality of the oocyte, so the uh, live birth prediction. So we can have different markers like the age, uh, markers of ovarian response, which can be different hormonal biomarkers or functional biomarkers like antral follicle count. Age is not a very good uh, predictor of ovarian reserve. As you can see, there is a lot of overlap in the age, but uh, we definitely know that with advanced maternal age, we shall get uh, usually low and lower number of oocytes after stimulation. Most important about the age is the quality of the oocyte because uh, here, for example, you can see uh, mitochondrial function is impaired uh, over the age of 35, but also granulosa cell numbers uh, will be reduced due to apoptosis. And we know that granulosa cells are important for the end maturation of the oocyte and oxidative uh, stress is increased over the age of 35. When we look at the euploidity of the nucleus, uh, we can see here, this is for example from my center, looking now almost at 5,000 uh, oocytes, uh, where first and second polar body have been tested with RICGH and also with NGS. And you can see that over the age of 35, there is a drop in the euploidity of the oocyte. So at the age of around over 40, 41, you will only have something like 10 to 15% of the oocytes which will be euploid. When we look at uh, uh, trophectoderm biopsies, um, this is uh, the American uh, study, you can see that independent from the number of oocytes or blastocysts that you will have, the rate of an euploidity will be the same. And again, over the age of 41, it's 15% uh, of the oocytes only will be euploid and 85% will be aneuploid, very much the same like what we have seen in the polar body in the oocytes. Now, uh, concerning the quantity, uh, using uh, antral follicle count or AMH will give the same probability uh, and predict uh, a poor response. And one can use uh, each of them by itself or a combination of them uh, though the combination will not add very much, as you can see here. But uh, if we try to predict uh, a live birth rate or ongoing pregnancy, uh, according to antral follicle count or AMH, we find uh, that it is not a good predictor because AMH and AFC are quantity markers. They are not quality markers of the oocytes. Another marker that we can have uh, a good look at is uh, the sensitivity of the follicles or the ovary to the FSH stimulation. And uh, we use the fourth, which is the follicle output rate. And uh, we can see here uh, two patients with the same uh, number of antral follicles at the beginning of the cycle, but a very different outcome after the same stimulation uh, here, about 70% of the antral follicles will go to preovulatory follicles, and here only 20%. We call this one a normal responder, and this one a hypo responder. So we can use the index of ovarian sensitivity to FSH also as a marker. And now we also have a new marker suggested by Poseidon Group, which is the follicle oocyte index, which means the number of the oocytes one will retrieve from a given number of antral follicle count and the cutoff point will be 50%. So now we have to be careful with the definitions uh, because we shall have patients who have a good ovarian reserve and patients with poor ovarian reserve. But uh, we also will have patients who have a poor ovarian response although they have a good ovarian reserve and patients who will have a good ovarian response although they have a poor ovarian reserve. A hyperresponder patient is a patient uh, having uh, adequate number of uh, follicles and oocytes, but will need to um, increase uh, amount of uh, FSH dose for the stimulation to achieve the same result as another patient. So this patient have a different uh, uh, sensitivity to either FSH or LH molecule, although those patients have the same reserve as patients who are, uh, act normally. So we can use nowadays also polymorphism of genetic markers like FSH receptors, LH receptors, or the LH molecule. 
And we know that the FSH receptor serin genotype, uh, the homozygote, the serin serin, will need much higher uh, amount of FSH stimulation in order to achieve uh, a good response and also addition of recombinant LH. And we also know that the uh, uh, variant beta LH uh, genotype, uh, the homozygote, uh, which will be about 15% of the population that you are treatment, also in Egypt, it's the same. Uh, they will need also a high amount of FSH and addition of LH uh, for stimulation, as this LH is a very short acting, uh, but uh, it's a very low bioactivity of this LH. When we look at patients identified as hyporesponders, and look what was the percentage of the serine serine homozygote, we shall find about 60% of the patients will have the hypo response due to the FSH receptor. And also LH uh, receptors uh, 291 and 312 are known in the hetero and homozygote to need more stimulation and need additional uh, LH for the stimulation in order to achieve a, a good response. Now here you can see three nice ladies and uh, they have something in common. They produced only three oocytes after a normal stimulation. But uh, when we, we look a little bit more carefully, so they are according to the Bologna criteria uh, and here's the history of the patient, they are all poor responder patient. Now this one is young patient with low ovarian reserve, uh, so she is expected uh, to be have a low number of oocytes. This one is young, but with a normal ovarian response uh, reserve, and this one is an older patient also with a normal ovarian reserve. Now the question is, uh, do they have the same prognosis? Will they have the same life birth rate with the three oocytes that they have achieved? And here you can see that indeed there is a difference. Although they have a low number of oocytes, this patient will have different outcome of the treatment. And uh, so uh, just uh, using now the Bologna criteria uh, to try to tell something at the, about the prognosis and the management of these three ladies will be probably a problem. So the problems that we have now with the Bologna criteria, although it was a step forward, is that uh, uh, we have a classification uh, to a group of patients which actually is not a homozygotic uh, uh, pair, but a heterogeneous uh, group of patients. And uh, there is some confusion existing uh, for the reason and the treatment for the poor response. And Bologna criteria actually is only a mathematical model and it tells you only something about the quantity of the oocyte, but it tells you nothing about the quality of the oocytes and doesn't take into the consideration. And there is of course no clinical recommendations what to do in uh, those patients. So there was a need to choose a different path and uh, <clears throat> trying to look more at uh, strat to stratify the patient according to the prognosis for a pregnancy and to use uh, both now the oocyte quantity, uh, which is uh, information about the reserve of the ovary, but also oocyte quality, which uh, is associated with the age of the patient. And also to try to find a way how to treat and uh, how to manage uh, these patients. So therefore, uh, this group, uh, these are the founders of the Poseidon uh, group and we met and this resort here on the island of Ischia uh, some five years ago. And uh, it took us, uh, we, we liked the name of the resort, it was called Poseidon, so we tried to find an acronym for Poseidon, more scientific one. And we came out after this meeting with this paper, uh, Infertility and Sterility, to demonstrate the new stratification uh, that uh, we uh, decided upon. And uh, we the working group of the Poseidon uh, also decided for a new measure of a successful treatment. And this is the ability to retrieve the number of oocytes which are necessary to obtain at least one euploid embryo, uh, mostly blastocyst, for transfer in each patient.
Uh, why did we choose uh, one euploid blastocyst? Uh, because uh, you can see here, these are now results again from my group here, looking at polar bodies. And this is from Professor Ubaldis from uh, Rome. And you can see that if we transfer a euploid um, uh, embryo, this is after polar body genetic testing, uh, the, uh, we can eliminate the age problem of the patient because they will have the same implantation rate in, in, independently from the age. And the same thing was also seen uh, when blastocysts were tested for euploidity. Transferring euploid blastocysts will eliminate also here uh, the age problem of the patient. So now we um, have uh, actually a full group of the patient if we combine ovarian reserve and age. We have now patients with good ovarian reserve and patients with poor ovarian reserve. And we pay patients which are young and patients which are old. And this gives us four subgroups. And uh, group one of the patients are younger patients, less than 35, with a good ovarian reserve, but with unexpected either very poor or suboptimal uh, uh, amount of oocytes after the first stimulation. And group two is the same like group one, only that they are older patients uh, than 35. Group three are young patients with expected low ovarian reserve and expected low numbers. And group four also with a low ovarian reserve, but older than 35. And we decided of the age of the 35 because that's what we could show also in my study with the polar bodies and also with the study uh, on uh, blastocyst, uh, that uh, that's where uh, the euploidity uh, rate started to, to be diminished. So when we look carefully at group one and group two, these are actually patients who are unexpected uh, low responders and uh, they are hyporesponder. These are the hyporesponder groups. And uh, another uh, group of collaborators that tried to look and presented this paper uh, two years ago um, uh, to look at which subgroups uh, will benefit from recombinant age. And uh, we found uh, actually only two subgroups where there was enough scientific uh, uh, evidence in the literature uh, to show that there is a benefit of using recombinant LH. And this were the hyporesponder patient and patients with advanced maternal age between 35 and 39. And uh, one of the studies uh, just came out a few months ago um, from uh, Alexander Conforti and Carlo Luigi showed that indeed in hyporesponse patients, Adding recombinant LH to recombinant FSH significantly will increase uh, the uh, uh, implantation rate and the ongoing pregnancy rate. Another question uh, to use recombinant LH uh, was in a poor ovarian response patient in the ASPART study, um, which was uh, published in 2017 after randomized uh, almost 1,000 patients, Bologna criteria aligned uh, poor responders uh, received either a fixed recombinant FSH or um, uh, additional recombinant FSH was recombinant LH. And the expected outcome was to have at least one more oocyte in the recombinant LH group because of some studies uh, that have been published before but there was no difference in the number of the oocytes between the two groups. But uh, in the post hoc analysis, when we looked at the lo uh, pregnancy loss and live birth rate, we found that in the moderate and severe uh, subgroup of the Bologna, so these are the older patients uh, with Bologna criteria, we see a lower pregnancy loss with recombinant FSH and recombinant LH and higher live birth rate, which was significant. So it means now we have the same number of oocytes, but the competence of the oocytes by using recombinant LH in this subgroup of patients uh, will be better. So now a, a little bit about the management. Uh, in group one, which are um, hyporesponder patients, they have a low fort or low FOI. Um, we uh, call them good reserver and good quality 
oocyte uh, patient. So here uh, we can do genetic testing to find out if they have a polymorphism of the receptor of the, uh, of the LH molecule. And we shall need uh, to increase uh, the dose of F FSH, add recombinant LH, and uh, try to synchronize the follicle cohort by using in the antagonist protocol either estrogens or progesterones. And we can do a fresh transfer because they will correct the number of the oocytes that uh, one can um, retrieve. Uh, group two is also uh, uh, low fort and low foy, so they're also hyporesponders. So here again, uh, we have to uh, uh, correct uh, the genetic uh, situation, um, the polymorphism, but they have a second problem because of their age, they will have a high aneuploidy of the oocytes and we have to take that into account. So group two Poseidon, are uh, actually good reserve patient, but with poor quality of all sides. And again, you will look for the polymorphism of the FSH LH and uh, uh, the LH molecule. And uh, for the treatment, you can still use antagonist protocol. You need to increase the recombinant FSH, need to add recombinant LH. And if you don't have enough follicles or all sides, according to the age, and uh, we also use a calculator for that, that I will uh, present you immediately. Um, then uh, you might want to do a double stimulation, dual stimulation, and uh, try to have more oocytes to increase the probability to find the euploid embryo. And uh, you can either use fresh transfer if you have enough oocytes in the first stimulation, or you can use a segmented uh, transfer if you need to do a double stimulation. So here, uh, also, the number of the oocyte is important. And here you can uh, now see uh, overview uh, and you can go to this uh, publication in front of endocrine uh, by Esteves uh, and you can see um, best practice overview uh, how you can treat and uh, deal with uh, group one and group two of the Poseidon. Now, group three and group four are having a low uh, reserve and there is no gonadotropin in the world that can compensate for the low number of follicles. So you cannot increase the number of the follicles in a given cycle. And uh, now you have to manage. So most of these groups are actually uh, a good responders because they get most of the oocytes out of a low number of follicles. So here is not the problem of a hypo response. Here's the problem of the reserve. So group three are low reserve, but a good quality of oocytes because they are young. And in this group of patients, uh, we can decide to use also the long agonist protocol uh, because they might have maybe one or two oocytes more in the long agonist protocol. Or if you use the antagonist, make sure to try to synchronize uh, the wave of the follicle uh, from the luteal phase before and you can decide uh, to use a dual stimulation and to increase the dose. We still, uh, the jury is out about uh, using androgens. Uh, there we are still waiting for the results of the big met, um, RCT that is still running on. And unless we have results there, we cannot say anything about uh, adding testosterone as pretreatment. And uh, the maximum dose of FSH should not exceed 300 units of recombinant FSH because it will not be helpful. And you can either decide for trans fresh transfer if you reach the number of oocytes that you wanted to reach or also use a double stimulation, of course. Now, group four is the more difficult one because they are also... <coughs> Sorry, it doesn't want to work because they are now a poor reserve, but also poor quality. And in this uh, group of patients, uh, you need, uh, of course, uh, uh, to try to do either a long agonist or antagonist protocol. If you do antagonist protocol, make sure you synchronize the wave of the follicle. Again, don't stimulate more than 300 units of recombinant FSH. But in this group, it's important to add recombinant LH 
because this is from the ESPAD study, the group with the moderate and severe uh, Bologna criteria group. Still, as I told you before, the juries are for androgens, the same for growth hormone. Dual stimulation can be beneficial for this group and uh, either fresh transfer of segmentation uh, depending on the number of oocytes that we want to achieve. And here again, a summary of group three and group four also was uh, published by the Poseidon group uh, a few uh, in the late uh, of 2019 and in frontiers of endocrinology and you are welcome to look at the publication. Now, uh, the Poseidon group also developed a calculator because we tried to find a way to calculate in each group and in each patient how many oocytes uh, we shall need uh, to find at least uh, one uh, euploid uh, blastocyst or potentially one euploid blastocyst for transfer. So in the calculator, we can enter all data from our laboratory, maturation rate, fertilization rate, cleavage rate, blastulation rate, euploidity rate that we know. We can also add into the calculator all information about the sperm, the age uh, uh, of the patient, the age of the husband, uh, sperm source, um, fragmentation, is it uh, testicular sperm or fresh sperm and so on. And then we come out with a number of oocytes in this very given patient. We can, of course, uh, use in the calculator generally published data, but it's, of course, uh, nicer to use data from the own laboratory. And uh, you can find this calculator on uh, the Poseidon website, and you can try to use it. And you can enter, when you open the window here, you can enter all this data that I was telling you before, and the calculator will tell you what will be the optimal number of oocytes that you want to achieve in this spe specific couple in order to find at least one euploid blastocyst. And according to the number that you have here and what the patient uh, will be uh, producing, uh, you can decide also uh, about the management, uh, what you want to do in order to reach uh, this number of oocytes. And, uh, and this is uh, important uh, because, uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, these are uh, uh, from uh, the validation of this calculator that was published by Sandro Esteves uh, for the Poseidon group. You can see that uh, in different age group, you will have different number of oocytes uh, and different probabilities uh, to reach uh, a euploid embryo according to the number of the oocyte in the different age group. And this can be also the, look different if you use now testicular sperm instead of uh, ejaculated sperm. So you see how all this information is uh, important. And uh, why is it important? Because when you started a treatment with a patient uh, of uh, one of these groups, you want to discuss with the patient the journey that they have to start. You're not discussing just one single cycle, but you discuss a journey because you will know the number of oocytes that you will have. You will know what is the patient capable to do and according to that and to subgrouping the patient into the one of the four blonde, uh, uh, Poseidon criteria, you can discuss the management with the patient, the burden of the treatment, the cost of the treatment, and uh, the patient will know from the beginning uh, what she needs probably to do and what is the journey uh, that is waiting for her. So it makes a consultation uh, with a patient much more easy and for the patient also better to understand uh, why uh, they not have to look only at one cycle and uh, keep them more compliant uh, to the treatment even if they are not uh, pregnant with the first cycle. So to conclude, we can say that hyporesponse is different from poor ovarian response and hyposensitivity, so standard FSH dose, uh, is a polygenic uh, trait and can cause unexpected poor or suboptimal response. And there is evidence that the FSH receptor polymorphism plays a crucial role, but also LH uh, molecule itself or LH uh, CG receptor are involved in determining uh, hyporesponse. And the concept of low prognosis should be developed by considering new categories of abnormal ovarian response, uh, now combining quality and quantity of the oocyte 
And the practical end point is to reach a number of oocytes uh, that is possible to retrieve or accumulately retrieve to find at least one euploid blastosis for the transfer. And uh, this should be uh, the clinical practice and the management of the patient. So thank you very much. Uh, here from Hamburg, you can see a picture of the uh, center of the town.